All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Stop LAPD Spying Coalition's uh, third Tuesday uh, of the month meeting. Uh, this is where we have our general meeting. My name is Hamid Khan. I'm with Stop LAPD Spying Coalition. I go by he, him. Um, and what I was going to ask if, uh, if folks are comfortable, uh, no pressure, but if you wouldn't mind just introducing yourself, your pronouns, and one quick comment as what brings you here today um, in chat, that'll be, that'll be superb, will be very helpful. And, uh, and yeah, um, so one of the things we wanted to do was that uh, uh, some of you or many of you have may have heard about uh, uh, the, the, rele the report that we released on November 8th, Automating Banishment, the Surveillance and Policing of Looted Land. Um, and what we wanted to do was to start a, a community conversation uh, around the report that how we are building our collective analysis, how we are building that collective knowledge, and how is it contributing to the, the broader culture of resistance um, that we are building as well. And then how are we kind of building that knowledge to build that collective power to really bring down these systems of extreme harm and these systems that continue uh, to cause a lot of trauma and violence um, in our communities. So personal violence, interpersonal trauma, uh, economic violence, you know, racial violence, you name it. And there's been a long history of that violence that has continued as well. So with that, um, you know, what our goal was to, to have this conversation, to lay the groundwork for these, uh, for these collective conversation, to do it over a period of time. Uh, so tonight is the first of the six-part series, and <clears throat> we're not really just tied up with the six-part series. If, if it needs to extend, we'll extend because we don't want to rush through this, the, these critical uh, exchanges and, and this knowledge building. Um, but tonight is the, the first, the start of the online uh, series of this conversation. Um, and then starting on, uh, on January 23rd, uh, we initially were going to do it on January 9th, but we are pushing it back just to, to monitor what happens with the, uh, with, the, with the variants and everything else that's going on. So we're starting our in-person conversations as well. And the first one, as of, as of right now, is tentatively scheduled for January 23rd. <clears throat> so that's that's what brings us here. But, we, but before we start this conversation, what we wanted to do was to kind of just have a brief sort of like, you know, check in with folks that what their thoughts are about this, this whole process that we are launching in and, um, and, and if they would like to join with us in building it together. Um, and also wanted to share a, a, a study guide that we are in the process of developing and to see like, you know, where, where folks are with, with, the, with that too. So I'm going to quickly bring up and then maybe if someone can post this link of the study guide um, that uh, this is for, for our part one for today. And I wanna uh, really appreciate and thank folks who are present as well, Mamta Aliwalia, um, uh, Nina, who've been helping us with this, Sabrina and other folks. So, so this is something that, uh, you know, what, what we have sent out and if, uh, if we, uh, you can open the link as well and follow this. So the idea is to create this study guide to kind of generate uh, the conversation, um, to have some sort of a understanding of key terms, which we will build together as well. And then from there on, kind of looking at like, you know, what sort of, these are some prompting questions. We're not tied to any of this, but this was just to be more generative about this space and before we leave today to be better informed to develop more of a collective analysis and then to kind of just uh, share this conversation with our neighbors with our uh, with our communities as well but we're also hoping that you will you will stay with us through the six part series um, uh, and if not all of them, with most of them, because we would love to hear your feedback and would love to hear how we have been building this work. Um, we've also, we are extremely honored uh, to be joined by, by uh, uh, very endearingly known as Grandma Gloria, um, who is a Tongva elder as well, who really guided us and helped us. Um, as we were, we were putting this report together, so our goal also is that as we go through each sections, you know, we will be will be inviting folks who who can give us their through their their own personal and collective sort of lived experiences as well. That the the the, the way we are approaching uh, these issues, whether they make sense and they are very much rooted in 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 the community's experience as well. 
So with that, um, I would just want to open it up to see if folks have any questions, any comments, any thoughts about the process that we are launching on today. Feel free to put it on ch in chat, or if you want to just uh, share your com comments, open up your mic, and uh, we'll just go from there. I any thoughts? Question. Yes, please. Um, I've seen the different parts delineated on the posters and the emails, and I was wondering um, if are they separate parts, as in the in person and the virtual, and if any are missed. Um, obviously, they're recorded, but how do they all play into each other, and how does it work in terms of uh, linear progression? In terms of if you miss one, and then before the next one, and whatnot. So um, uh, they are the in person is going to be the same thing. It'll going to be a process of building, um, you know, just we as we are today for folks who may not be able to access or get online or people who are more interested to be present uh, and the vibe that being in person creates. Um, but as far as if you miss one, I saw Mamta kind of just uh, having a big smile and saying, like, "Oops, we didn't really go through that whole thing." So, so let's just let's have a collective uh, conversation. Like, okay, in case if we do miss one, what do folks think would be the best way to to approach it? We expect. I mean, there's going to be a quiz after each one of them. So, or guess I, I'm also wondering if a good question is like, uh, um, you know, if if you were to miss one what would you what would be useful like what would you enjoy receiving or what would be like what are we imagining might be a way that you would hope to to get an update like would it be as we said you could check out the recording but is there something else like would you like to get a study guide that perhaps has some things filled in or like what are those things we would hope for any thoughts on that that tie Hi. Um, I mean, I know that I'm taking notes that I, well, I guess a related question is like, what do we feel comfortable having go out of the room where people are co-present, like in the form of notes and recordings? Because I know like I'm taking some notes for Tech Workers Coalition, people who can't be here, but then uh, if somebody says something about what's going on in organizing, you know, I want to be respectful of not disclosing that. Um, but but I, I know that I think for me, like I'm, I'm very grateful if there are recordings, but I also understand the need to create spaces where people feel like accountability to who else is there. <laughs> Thank you, Lily. Thank you for that comment. Other thoughts? Maybe one of the things we could do is that, uh, and this is a, a proposition here uh, for folks to uh, to kind of see how they feel, and really appreciate uh, Lily you taking the notes. That maybe what we could do is uh, obviously there's a recording, um, but uh, if uh, you would be open to welcome sharing some of the notes too, and you know just maybe using your best judgment what to take out, and we can also remove some of the things that could be sensitive. Um, That's good. So, yeah. So, and then we can put them on, um, you know, just a feedback as a feedback and from the first conversation, which I think would be very, which would also be very uh, uh, informative um, as to recording is one thing, but, you know, just even like looking at the notes, sometimes people look at things a little different, in different ways. So, yeah. Thank you. And we can post them on the website as, as a document itself. Any other thoughts? I, I think you're muted. I uh, The phone is muted, so we didn't hear you. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Gloria. How are you? Got a little bit of voice back. Um, I think the way I received the, the information, it, it had my points. And then there was, you know, that was... Uh, there was more to that, you know, but the point kind of summarized what the document is about. And so the way I read it, I, I looked at each of those points and I found, found what kind of interested me. 
So I think if we make like summaries, you know, rather than reading pages and pages and pages, uh, that might be a little bit more um, easier to deal with, uh, you mm -hmm. know. I, I mean, it's very academic, number one. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, and it's written beautifully, you know, but I prefer smaller things to understand rather mm -hmm. than reading a lot of document. That's my personal. Sure. Thank you uh, for raising that, uh, Gloria, because we're also, there's a summary for the report too. Uh, and I'll, I'll share that um, in, in a couple of minutes. So we'll go to the website and maybe walk folks through that as well. So yeah, definitely. And if there's additional pieces that you can think of, yes. Okay. Thank you. Mamta, did you want to make a comment? Um, no, I just know that there are other suggestions in the chat. Um, folks are suggesting a buddy system um, as well. I think that's a great idea. Just wanted to lift that up. That's a great idea. Maybe at the end we could have, um, I don't know, folks who want to share their information, their email or whatever um, with others um, and buddy up. That could be one way to do it. That would be great. That's exactly where we want this to go, to build and to organize and build that collective knowledge. Thank you. Any other thoughts as we move on? Cool. Well, this was, um, this was definitely uh, very helpful and, and I think it really helps us because obviously, you know, we haven't fully thought out everything and that was also intentional as well because we don't want to just parachute in and say, well, this is the way it should be done. We just wanted to create a baseline uh, sort of an uh, opportunity to have these conversations and then kind of build from there. Um, yeah. So with that in mind, and I just wanted to see if uh, other folks who've been deeply involved in the report have any other thoughts, uh, Shakir, uh, Tiff, Amira, Matios, if I'm missing anybody else, anything else that what you've heard? Cool. Okay. All right, so maybe just put your, your, your suggestion in, in, in chat as well. So not to put everybody on the spot, just to get a, um, like, uh, who all has read the report? <laughs> awesome, awesome, awesome. Cool, cool, cool. Well, that's, thank you. I mean, that it's, it's really an honor to, you know, just, just to see that folks are interested, folks have read the report and, uh, but you, even if you have not, absolutely uh, no issue with that. And that's what we are here and, and to do that. So, so what I, uh, what I thought maybe we can do is to uh, <clears throat> uh, maybe quickly go through what, why the report, the introduction piece, and then I would love to, and, and, I, and I promise Gloria that I'm not gonna impose too much uh, on her time, um, you know, but, but it'll be great to have a, 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 some thoughts from Gloria about section one, about not a moment in time, where we are, we are looking at it through the, the, the lens and the history of conquest um, and settler colonialism and the removal of people and how that cultural resistance amongst uh, uh, our native siblings still continues to be built and what we can learn around organizing uh, from that. So, so just, uh, uh, you know, who we are for folks who, who are not familiar with Stop LAPD Spine Coalition, we have been around and that's what kind of going through the introduction, it, 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 it picks up these things. Um, we've been around for 10 years now, this is our 10th year, um, and it was a coming together of people uh, from uh, various kind of just uh, organizing, uh, uh, you know, ways, but, but, but typically people who had been organizing around the, 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 the national security police state, state violence, police brutality, police violence, um, and what some of us back in 2010 realized that uh, how rapidly the, these counterterrorism 
type tactics and counterinsurgency type tactics, both uh, you know, in, in the context of intelligence gathering and the practical unleashing of those tactics that, the, the, uh, that were being used in Iraq and Afghanistan, how they were being incorporated into our local policing. Um, you know, you've heard a lot about predictive policing, for example, or if you have not, predictive policing has been in, in, in the news. Uh, and that, that has been one of our biggest fights. Predictive policing was conceived, was developed, and, 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 and unleashed very much on the battlefronts of Iraq and Afghanistan. This was something that started off with a Department of Defense contract, then that turned into this whole thing that how they will predict insurgencies, which was then brought home at the, to the LAPD. This, this got started off by some professor at UCLA, Professor of Anthropology, Jeff Branthingham, and Professor of Mathematics. Um, as well. So some of these people, and then that as everything goes, war abroad is war at home. Um, then, you know, just those tactics were very much incorporated into domestic policing. A lot of uh, sort of the, 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 the tools that they use for surveillance, you may have heard about cell phone, stingrays, uh, cell phone catchers, license plate readers, high definition cameras, facial recognition technologies, um, and various other things they are all very much based in military occupation and, and their counterterrorism, counterinsurgency operations as well. So for that's what brought the coalition together. And from the very beginning, the coalition has been fiercely abolitionist because we don't believe that this can be reformed. The system that is fundamentally flawed by design and rotten to the core um, is, is just, just it's, it's at least we can't think of any ways. And people have been trying, people have been on the front line um, and with the LAPD, if this is the way that continues to operate over the last 152 years, then it's 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 a challenge thinking that uh, that we can even even reform this thing. Um, and this this really the report, and it as it says in the in the in the introduction as well, that that it it, it studies the the relationship um, of of policing and surveillance, that how it relates to gentrification how it, it relates to, to displacement of people. And it looks at that, that, that the way that how real estate development and, and, and you know, just massive development that we, we, have, we were seeing living in Los Angeles, what is the relationship to police in that? What is a cozy relationship? And, and to really take a step further that what exactly is the conspiracy that is being hatched between law enforcement agencies and the control of land now that that you know that we are dealing with and that's where the the role of data driven policing comes in um, and when we talk about data-driven policing, just to also uh, speak about it, that data-driven is not like a post 9-11 concept. It didn't start with gathering people's social media. It, uh, it, it, it doesn't start with, uh, you know, just getting people into putting, so following their cell phones or, or gathering data through license plate readers or various other ways that intelligence happens. Data has always been present. Data has always been a part and parcel of policing. Data has always been central to how social control happens and who and what and how is, is allowed to move in particular ways. What communities need to be criminalized, who needs to be contained, who needs to be controlled, who needs to be criminalized. And that's basically has been the role of data throughout um, in within the systems of control. And that's how imperialism and capitalism, and we talk about these large ideologies and, and, and practices and traditions at imperial patriarchy and white supremacy and now increasingly scientific objectivity are being moved with the claims that you know this is the only way we can live our lives and we're like no wait a minute this is no that's not going to happen so so in a sense um, data and that's why but but for us it's also important that how these the data driven policing is moving and at what pace it's moving as well that it's moving literally at the, the way you know, data is being processed, where it would take um, crime analysts maybe five or six hours to go through a document. Now it takes less than five minutes with tools like Palantir who like, you know, are, are, these, are these military and CIA built uh, technologies that process our information with the speed of light and within, within a few minutes at all. So, so that's, that's critical. Um, and, and, then, and then, you know, just, just 
but we also want to ground ourselves in history as well. So one of the things that we say at the coalition, that it's not a moment in time, but a continuation of history. So, so in a sense that just as we look at the history of imperialism and colonization as occupying forces, they would, they would use um, intelligence gathering and data collection to monitor native populations, to monitor the movement of people. Similarly, uh, we have to understand LAPDs. So when we talk about, you know, that it's, it's rooted in occupation, it's rooted in conquest, it's rooted in settler colonialism. It's not just using these words, it's really, you know, just, just following that whole trajectory that how these things have evolved over time and how they continue to impact our lives. And then obviously, you know, when, where is it going? And I think that's really a critical piece for us as well, that how data-driven policing has now become this, 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 you know, answer for everything that, you know, in a sense, when we look at, for example, just and, 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 I, and I want to broaden the understanding of policing itself, not just limited to law enforcement itself, but policing of the body. So that's where we created this whole image and concept of the stalker state. So how data is being used by, by public sector agencies, for example, how information that is being gathered to impact people's Section 8 vouchers, how information and data collection is taking place that is impacting, you know, just child protective services, how Department of Children and Family Services is, is impacting all of our lives by, by using data to criminalize the communities um, as, much as, as much as they can, how information just, you know, we go, uh, Right now, we are in the middle of, of a pandemic, a global pandemic. So how this information that is being collected would be weaponized or is being weaponized as a medium of social control. So I think that's when we talk about data-driven policing, uh, it is while it is very much about the LAPD, it's about law enforcement as we know it. But I think we also need to, to open ourselves up to understanding and learning and building and critically examining that how data-driven policing not only means law enforcement, but it's really the policing of our body and policing of our body in which these, these in, in, just kind of operating in these vast ecologies um, of, of, of these systems, whether it's like that ecology that, that includes the federal government, whether it includes our local local governments, whether it includes our politicians, whether it includes our private sector, whether it includes our public sector, whether it includes nonprofits, whether it includes the academy, the academia is deeply complicit in this thing. So I think that's really the, the larger message that we are trying to get out to the communities that, you know, that we need to really engage and really inform our, our culture of resistance as we are building it by kind of just breaking it down with each other and breaking it down together. So just wanted to kind of just do this introduction really quick. And, 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 and in essence, um, I just want to quickly read something in, in our introduction as well, that how data mining and behavioral surveillance, but how data mining is being supercharged. Uh, and it supercharges the violence of policing. Um, and, and it says that, that sometimes the purpose is banishment, removing us from our homes and communities. Sometimes it's containment, restricting us from the areas police want to secure for gentrification. Sometimes it's blight, targeting areas of, for neglect in order to maintain racial and class hierarchies. Sometimes it's extraction, exploiting our wealth, labor, and resources. And sometimes it's elimination killing or incarceration or incarcerating our people. Whatever the purpose, what links these practices is the process of conquest. Now, yes, and thank you, Gloria, for, 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 for appreciating it, that it's very well written, but it's also, you know, there's a deep meaning that we are, we are looking to lift through this as well, because each one of these things, whether we are talking about banishment or containment, a blight or extraction or elimination, this is our, the lived experiences of our communities. This is what has been going on for the last 500 years. So, so we cannot, we can never forget. And we need to build on those that, that, you know, not a moment in time, but a continuation of history. And how that, 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 that moment in time needs to be really looked at and what that continuation of history means, not just an exaggerated statement or not just kind of just like rhetoric, but really grounded in, in facts and grounded in the histories of our people. And, and lastly, for the introduction piece, I would also on behalf of the coalition say that, you know, we are not very fond of data. I mean, to the extent that we almost want to abolish data because, you know, as much as we gather data as well, well, the data is 
what, what really highlights the data is basically what harms us the most. And, and, and another, another one thing I, I would say that uh, the, what, the, what the report really lifts as well, that when predictive policing was launched in Los Angeles and Operation Laser, the Los Angeles Strategic Extraction and Restoration uh, Program was launched, one of the things that they wanted was immense amount of data. The guy who created uh, Operation Laser, Craig Uchida, he, he was, he's been documented by saying, and I'm just paraphrasing, that it, when we stop and frisk people, when we stop people, it's not just about like, you know, that we are stopping them. I just want data. I just want data to go within these systems. And I just want to, I just want to just, uh, so that we are able to then trace and track and monitor in order to contain and control and, uh, control and criminalize. So I'll end there and see if there's any thoughts about the introduction piece or any 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 conversation or any commentary about that of how we are grounding this report. I'd like to say something. Please. Um, I've been an activist since the '60s, and everything you were talking about about surveillance and so forth. You know, uh, it reminds me of how um, how far technology has come and how sophisticated intelligence is now. And you know, I can remember in the, the old days that uh, uh, my phone was tapped; you could hear the clicking. You know, they were recording. Okay, now there's I guess there's laws against that now, so they find other ways to do it. I mean, they can listen from long distances and you know and i remember being followed in my car you know and knowing it was law enforcement i remember um you know them breaking into my car and stealing photographs because i did a newspaper and uh you know there were other things in my car you know nothing of value you know but uh um then you know who it is because it was the photos. You just know. And, uh, uh, you know, I think about all the data that is collected to it in every aspect of our lives. In our finances, through the bank, they want all this information, um, to using a credit card. You know, on Facebook, they even getting into this Zoom, they were requesting to copy, you know, have uh, access to photos and recordings, you know. So, I mean, we're just, I, I feel like there's numbers all over my body <laughs> that says who I am. And it's amazing how sometimes when, I, because I lost all my data, my, my, my phone, um, when I fill in a password, they have all the other information that pops up. I don't even have to write it anymore. All I have to do is hit a little button and it you know, puts it in. I mean, they know everything. And, it, and they is everything. <laughs> you know, it's, it's um, probably even the way we eat. They, they, when I purchase something from Amazon, they already know what my buying experience is. And they put those products there. Uh, based on your past purchases. So, I mean, we, we are just living in a world where everything is um, documented, you know, and they know about you as an individual. Law enforcement, yes. And law enforcement, I think um, they use that data. Um, what's the first thing they do when they stop a person? they run a make on you as we used to call it and if you have any arrest records and whatever you know whatever else they look at uh it's all there you know and based on that is how they're going to treat that individual oh this guy's got a long sheet here you know so he's trouble so already they've already you know judged him and are going to treat him a certain way to the, to them he's dangerous you know, so, and then when I go back to First Nation people, you know, we, um, I believe we were raised to respect each other's and always, um, we didn't have law enforcement. 
You know, we didn't have a body that oversaw what we did. If somebody did something wrong, they had to be addressed by the community or by the leaders, you know, and uh, admonished or whatever, you know, what the treatment was, but nobody was jailed, nobody was beaten. Um, I've never ever read anything about abuses to women by men or vice versa. Um, you know, I don't know if that existed, you know, like, like we have rape, we have uh, abuse, physical, mental um, abuse, you know, and that includes children and children, my understanding the way our children were raised, they could walk with us as adults, but they could not participate in the conversations. And even as I was coming up and learning from, you know, the elders, they would tell me, Gloria, you have to bite your tongue. You cannot ask questions. Just listen and you'll get teachings. And I remember one time I had a question because I am that kind of person that's very curious. I want to poke it. I want to poke it. And I would get an elbow on my side and that was shut your mouth. You know, and I had to learn how to listen. And that's a good lesson in itself to be able to hear what somebody is saying to you. So, you know, uh, and when the colonizers came, when they came and they took our women and our children back to Europe for sex purposes, they were the original traffickers. And then in the missions, we were made to dress from chin down to the floor when we didn't need clothing in beautiful California weather. We dressed accordingly. And you know we were considered savage. We were considered uncivilized. Uh, it's still written on the San Gabriel mission that the priests came to civilize the savage Indians, barbaric Indians they called us. And you know our our lives were perfect. We had everything we needed. Now that's been taken away and changed, and laws were put in, and we weren't allowed to do this. We were paid with alcohol to work on the ranches and put in jails. And it was a vicious cycle. You just couldn't escape it unless you ran away from the missions. So a lot of people did that. I had an uncle that wrote books <clears throat> and that was all captured in that, those books of that time. He took people up to Bakersfield. He was a vaquero, an Indian horseman or an Indian cowboy, I guess. Um, you know, and he tells a lot of the stories of that period, you know, and, uh, that was in the 20s. So um, we carry a lot of trauma. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Young people, I feel sorry for the young. I, 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 it's not even being sorry. It's fear of young people because the color of their skin might get them killed just mm -hmm. over a traffic stop. Mm -hmm. You know, that is so frightening to me. You know, because I have grandchildren, a 13 year old. Um, you know, my sons, I remember raising them. If the police came up on this side, I tell them, don't look at them. And they go, why? Don't look at them. Just keep looking straight. Because if you eyeball them, that was a reason to get stopped. Mm -hmm. You know, so, um, you know, I'm going to go on and on and on, but I don't want to. Uh, mm -hmm. But, <laughs> um, you know, this is very eye-opening to look at what you are writing about. It's almost like future, where people are not really thinking about these kinds of things. You know, only maybe some people like me that know what has gone on since mm. the 60s. And then probably before that, it was going on. You know, mm. but I can speak, I can make testimony for myself. Right. And I, I have seen many people beat up by law enforcement. I have seen them try to hit children with their batons. Uh, when I went on the Poor People's Campaign, I saw that in Washington, D.C. Um, you know, so um, it's really, you know, I, I'm too old to go out there now in the front lines, you know, but I, you know, but I can still teach people about it, tell them about it. That's... That, that, that's a lot of love, Gloria, that you're sharing with us. Thank you. A lot of love. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you. And I, I'm so excited. I want to ask you a couple of things, but I like I promised that I would hold off uh, and, and and let you rest a little bit. So we, but but I still promise I'm not going to impose too much because you and I spoke earlier and, and I, you were telling me about your throat and all. So, yeah, definitely. But thank you for 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 that. Really appreciate it. Um, others um, on um, how the what was the introduction and what it was based upon and built upon any thoughts well uh it's been a few weeks since i read the report um and uh, i just wanted to commend you all for its depth and its substance um i i thought i i please don't I, I don't know that I could uh, pass a pop quiz on it right now because it's been a few weeks and I need to reread it, but I thought it was really good. Um, and uh, one of the key points that I think it gets across is how, and, and I think that is um, really needs to be, um, w could be useful and just re like continuing to, to repeat it as, you know, as, um, as a mantra or as a theme is, you know, I guess it's a cliche that, oh, big data rules, but it's, it's, it's the power and it is ultimately it's about power and control and who has it and who can wield it over, over what populations. So, you know, it's, it is a data is a commodity. Um, but ultimately, um, it's about who has the power. It, it comes back to who has the power and who has the control of it and who wields it over whom. Thank you. Thank you. Other thoughts or comments before we move into section one? And people are putting some comments as well. I can quickly read them. Thank you for your comment, Michelle, for the introductory portion, realizing that the a critical aspect, communicating this work to my neighbor depends on understanding land as a definition of our bodies. Thank you. As a requirement for survival, in white, identifying Orange County, this is largely invisible to us. I hope to create an intro piece that walks people to that aspect before hitting the full report. Really appreciate that. Thank you, Michelle. Other thoughts, other comments? Maybe just uh, uh, Shakir or Tiff, because you two were really key in kind of putting the, the report. And I, and I just want to honor that, that last count, there were 26 writers of this report. Um, and, and it took at least about 26 people. It took uh, uh, almost like uh, starting in July or August, like every first and third Monday of the working group. Um, it was a, a, a working group that worked on the executive summary to bring it together. That was went on for about six months or so. So, and then uh, speaking to community members as, you know, we, we reached out to Grandma Gloria, as we were kind of grounding this report, like, you know, were we on the right track when, you know, just wanted to get feedback. We spoke to folks because we do our deeper dive into certain communities as well. We spoke to our elders and other folks in the Crenshaw district as well and talked to them. But uh, just when you were maybe uh, Tiff, Shakir, Amira, whoever, Matios wants to just share a couple of thoughts briefly that as you were putting this report together, what were you all thinking about from the introduction side of it? It's not a trick question. <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in real quick I'll, um, because, well, I mean, I made that face because I'm remembering how um, I'm hi folks. I'm sorry. My name is Tiff. They then pronouns. I'm remembering how um, when we did start this process together in that working group, how it began because we had gotten a lot of information back about what LAPD was doing. Um, we gotten a lot of uh, documents and we were starting to look at them together and they had shut down the, the program Operation Laser, but we were um, kind of looking at them together and deciding what does it mean and, and looking more into what was the impact, what was going on there. 
And we realized that we wanted to invite the community in to, um, to engage with us around what we were learning. And we were kind of seeing, you know, seeing, seeing what the documents were saying and we're thinking, how do we share this out with folks? And so it started from the effort of um, wanting to make this a collaborative process and to be talking with folks about this more. So we started by the goal was to put together a 10 page uh, brief, we called it for a long time, uh, to be able to share with folks about what we were what we were learning and to be saying, this is what we're looking at and learning and to be inviting folks to share with us. Um, and I love that it did, of course, take, it took much longer and it grew and grew and grew and additional folks came in, as Hamid said, um, and just we had so many people just like bring a specific piece or conversation or even sometimes a paragraph. And it was just, it was, it was, um, I won't go on and on, but um, yeah, really great collaborative effort. And so I'm just remembering, like, it's just been very much like a, a, a discovery for us in a learning process, uh, putting it together and hearing from folks, um, kind of putting that analysis around it. And of course, that that still continues, um, continues now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tiff. Um, anyone else who had uh, their hands on from the beginning? Hey, I can also talk a little bit sure. about the intro. Yeah, hi everyone here also at some of these buying. Um, yeah, I just remember, I mean, as Tiff's describing this process of, of um, kind of collectively starting to look at the documents, people kind of making different connections, sharing them, seeing, okay, we're seeing how LAPD works over here with these developers, how they work over here with um, uh, these business improvement districts. Like, and then when we finally started writing it, this introduction, the, the, the text of it really kept changing over time because it was sort of like, you know, unlike in a more maybe kind of academic type research project where you have like maybe something you're trying to prove like a thesis or something like that here over time, we just kind of kept noticing more and more things that we were like, this is thematically how this all connects. And so the, that introduction just kind of kept getting longer and longer to frame the whole storytelling. And I think one of the, the pieces of the intro that the intro is really kind of covering is that um, that when we talk about, when, when you look at the relationship between land and policing, that you can't understand that without looking at some of the ideologies that, that um, have always characterized policing and that settler colonialism and conquest, the kind of theft of land and the, the, um, the state's defense of, of the property system and, and and system of you know owning land and and based on and all of it land that was um, stolen that that you can't understand the policing of land without that, understanding that history just as you can't understand um, policing um, and incarceration today without understanding the role of um, of, of uh, enslavement of, of apartheid of Jim Crow like if you're going to look at the relationship of land of policing to land and the relationship of policing to development and real estate, you have to look at settler colonialism. And that shows up not just as kind of a, um, you know, acknowledging that history and, and, um, and, and uh, understanding, it, it's not just a sort of a matter of history, it's like literally the purposes of policing today, even answers to questions like, why is it that the state is willing to spend so much more money on, on criminalizing people who are just, you know, occupying uh, like people who are living on the street or making their homes and in, in, in on their own versus the money that would probably it would be it would cost less to literally you know provide land to 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 provide them shelter, but this kind of like the reason that's so ex the, the reason that we make those choices again is because this country was founded on these kinds of ideologies of of using the state to banish people using the state to clear land using the state to take play, to take land away from people more than to provide to provide shelter to provide these things that that um that yeah so th like those to understand those operations you need to look at the kind of logic and ideology of of settler colonialism guiding it in the same way that things you know that yeah the things just you can't make sense of of policing's relationship to race today without looking at the history of enslavement in that same way thank you shakir thank you other thoughts? <clears throat> okay. Cool. 
And uh, before we go any further, I, 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 I cannot but uh, move further without acknowledging our dear friend and comrade, Jamie Garcia, uh, that uh, whose leadership has been phenomenal in, in bringing it together and, uh, and really kind of just, just uh, coordinating a lot of this stuff. Um, so yeah, so, so kudos to, to Jamie and Jamie's leadership. Um, so uh, I wonder if people have seen the report because, because what we'll do is then we'll look at the first section and kind of looking it together. So, um, so here's, this is where the report is. And if folks have not seen the report, then, uh, you know, just, uh, there's, there's a, a, this is just the, the cover. This is our website. Uh, and it goes into various things, into various chapters or sections. There's a whole intera interactive map uh, that you can open up that is, is a process of development. And I'm sharing this because we also want to, before we leave today, wants to generate ideas that how people can take this back, uh, this information into their own local communities and, and map these things out. Like this is the map of Los Angeles. Um, and it goes further up as well, uh, looking at, uh, uh, you know, just this is Skid Row, downtown Los Angeles, how, you know, in, in, in communities are impacted as a result, who was killed where, um, you know, these are the, these are kill zones, laser zones where people were actually murdered by the LAPD during, in these areas as well. This is all the, the quarantining and the digital Jim Crow, if you will, of Skid Row, that how they were using predictive policing and these hotspots and laser zones and all of these you know, uh, uh, technical terms to basically to to create a digital boundary to create this this segregation again digitally by masking it in computer science and masking it in various things so you can look up that the history of that too and various other things and and so report goes on and on and on um, and then um, you know just going back to so uh, back to the report. Um, there's, so there's, there's, there's a summary of the report here as well that people can look at. It's about a 12 page report summary. Um, and then here's the actual report to, um, you know, just to where uh, you can, you can actually, you can go through the report and just, uh, so that's, uh, let's see what section is that. That's the introduction. That's uh, the first part. So now let's just go to um, and, and here's this some, some, you know, just basic, you know, comments from folks, uh, our dear brother and comrade Pete White, um, you know, just, and, and when we were talking about, so initially we talked, uh, thought about between displacement and banishment. However, I know that um, uh, Shakir, you were sharing that Jamie had already like way earlier on had talked about like, man, let's just uh, uh, call it automating banishment. But then we talked about it and I think Pete says it really well that displacement is when you have somewhere else to go. Banishment is when there, there is nowhere except jail or death. So, so I think that's why banishment became a, a, a very clear to us that why we need to use this term and why uh, you know, we, we are calling it automating banishment. So now going back on section one, what I was hoping to do was, and then Gloria, I'm gonna impose on you a little bit more that can somebody setting the tone, can somebody from the audience read this first paragraph and just read it loudly so we can all hear it together. Anybody? Please. I got you, Hamid. Um, okay. Uh, from the start, settlers in the US have occupied land by policing it. Under settler colonialism, everyone and everything existing on that land must be dominated, managed, or eliminated to make way for the needs of white supremacy and capital. This is why we have police. It is impossible to separate policing from land theft and occupation Harm to those in close relationship with land is not an accidental result. A policing is it is the intended result. Great, thank you, thank you very much for doing that. So, so Gloria, the, uh, to to get this conversation going, the question is that we are making this claim and linking this policing as we are in today in Los Angeles with settler colonization, with conquest, with mass removal of people. So from your vantage point and, 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 and the history that you bring and the relationships and you, know, you being also very actively involved, I mean, is that a stretch when we say that? Or does that make sense that you know, we are making these connections between settler colonization and gentrification? And I like you, you get it. <laughs> um, because when you tell people, you know, they say, well, get over it, you know, it, it's mm. done, you know, no. It doesn't go away, it stays 
in you. It's a trauma that you carry for the rest of your life of how you've been treated. And when you read that the first governor of California, Bennett, uh, went to uh, whoever the lawmakers were um, and got approval to exterminate native people. I just came across a, a horrible, some documents of proof of payment for the heads of Indians. They got $5 per head, okay? And to save, you know, that they would, they described throwing babies into baskets that they had killed, you know? Uh, there's a book, uh, the, the Book of Hopi, written by Dee Brown. And she talked about um, the, um, the extermination that the US Senate agreed to of native tribes. And the cavalry would go into these, these places where the they were set, camps were set up, right? And they'd shoot all the men, they'd bang the babies and women's heads on trees to say bullets, okay? And that's history. Okay, and I don't see people referring to that. So you are not incorrect in saying what you say. Uh, you know, I understand it very deeply. You know, and and it almost, you know, it just, it's almost like a, they say we carry um, cultural trauma. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you know, when you think about these children that have been in these boarding schools and were taken away from their parents, put into schools. Uh, and I think I said this before, uh, the idea was kill the Indians, save the men. So they cut the children's hair, made them wear uniforms, made, they couldn't speak their language, couldn't pray the way they were accustomed to praying, uh, dress the way they were doing or ceremonies or songs or anything like that. And then now they're finding that over a hundred years ago, all these children they were putting in these schools um, were tortured. And they're finding when they dig them up, they can tell what happened to them. And I started reading stories and I couldn't talk about them unless, without crying. Uh, and it's so painful to see a little coffin being reburied. They took the, the babies that they dug up, that they found, their families are all gone now, you know? But can you imagine as a mother having your child taken away, put in a school that you cannot see, cannot touch your child anymore, cannot love it and that little child all by itself being tortured by some bad person i like animals so i won't say some animal okay i like animals um bad humans i don't like okay and i i just can't imagine the trauma that they were exposed to and the, the violence you know i read a story where a nun put a child between the mattresses and jumped up and down on it until the, baby, the child died. I read where they would take them out and just leave them out in the wilderness, you know, and they died. You know, so then now they're finding these bodies around these schools and they finally get to come home. And I, in my prayers, I say, you know, I hope that they went back to the arms of their mama, you know, to take that love taken away from, you know, mom. And then culturally we were, we were always told, don't reveal yourself to these colonizers. And so what they would say, they would go into these um, community reservations, you know, and they would want to take the child away from the parents. And because they didn't show emotion, they figured, oh, they don't want the kid. You know, it wasn't that. They were taught, don't expose yourself. Don't show your power. Don't, you know, you can't. And probably we're told you can't win. You're going to take them anyways. So that's the kind of um, history there is. Um, and no, I'm not going to get over it. I do not forgive. I do not forget. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. So um, some people in, in my Native community, sometimes people say, um, I don't know how to talk to your people because we tend to not want to talk. I, I, I'm the opposite. I tend to want to talk about everything. <laughs> so, uh, but um, I know if I were to go back and tell my community about this, some of them will understand it, but I think the elders will not. 
they will be, why are you involved in something like that? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. but if I explain to him, they really understand the beginnings of mm -hmm. land, mm -hmm. of land being taken and us being stripped of our lands and rights to our lands, our homelands, where all our ancestors are buried, are being disturbed. And there is nothing more disturbing. I've worked with a lot of sacred sites, Bosa Chica, Cerritos Wetlands, um, what's the other one? Puluna, Long Beach. Um, when in their development, okay, and we stand in front of those big, we used, I used to stand in front of those big tractors, those big backhoes, and say, you have to run me over. You're not going to dig up a village. And we probably usually lose, right? And um, then they dig up all our ancestors, and we have to rebury them. And we watch them as they put them in black trash bags, their remains. And then, you know, we have to fight with those remains. You know, and the universities take them and study them. I don't know why, mm -hmm. how much information can you get from a bone yeah. or a human being yeah. or remain? You know, right. so that's what we have to go through. So when you talk about land in the very beginning in policing, absolutely, including the state, the government, you know, exterminating, passing laws to exterminate just because you're an Indian. Mm -hmm. Just Thank because you. you're a person of color, you will be a slave. Mm -hmm. Just because you're an Asian person, you will build the railroads and do the washing. Those are the mm -hmm. stereotypes you put mm -hmm. on us, okay? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of that kind of hit my bone there. <laughs> you know, right. it really right. uh, brought up Fox. You know, right. so thank you for that. You know, I, I don't mind talking about that. So, you know, but, you know, we have to come forward and say, here we are. Yes. And this yes. is what we have. And how yes. do we deal with this now? Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Any, mm -hmm. uh, anyone else has any questions or comments uh, for Gloria on that piece? Because we'll go through a couple more passages uh, as we have this conversation. Okay, let's just go back to it real quickly. And uh, okay, so uh, the, where was it? Yeah, there it is. <clears throat> Can someone read this, please? I can read it, on it. Sure. While the Tongva people struggle for land rights and resist their physical and cultural destruction, the settler colonial apparatus that forcibly severed them from their land has continued to target the Black and Indigenous peoples who have come to LA. The Tongva village where downtown LA now stands was forced to relocate, and the Indigenous and, and Mexican people who came to the city in search of work were criminalized and incarcerated by police. Any discussion of neocolonialism and the continuation of conquest and land theft must be grounded in an understanding of Tongva history and ongoing resistance and a commitment to Tongva sovereignty and land rights. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthias. Any comments and thoughts on that? And Gloria, more than welcome to share your thoughts. Well, it's very accurate again. You know, um, uh, Los Angeles was Yagna. It was an, an important village in that um, people traveling would tend to stop there, which, you know, eventually became the city of Los Angeles. Um, and we had a lot of, we had burials there in next to the, what they call the Placita, a uh, little church right there on Ol Olvera Street. Mm -hmm. And when they were moving them, they removed all these burials, okay? And what we found, we got involved, I don't know how we got involved, but we found there was a hundred coffins they did not remove. Mm -hmm. So we said, 
that our people were buried there. And they said, oh no, there was no Indians. And we were saying, well, how do you define Indian? How do you identify an Indian? Oh, if there's little beads, strings of beads, that identifies that that person was an Indian. Oh, come on now. <laughs> no. Um, anyways, we found out where they, they had removed those, those uh, burials and uh, they were claiming they didn't know what happened to all those uh, coffins. And then they removed the 100, and this is when they were building, uh, they call it the Placita de Cultura y Artes, um, arts and cultural thing. And, and, you know, it's built on a, a cemetery, you know? Um, it wasn't as old as our very old, old burials where we just put them in the ground and, you know, did it with ritual and so forth. Uh, and ceremony. And to this day, most people don't, aren't even aware that there's on um, the north side of Olvera Street, big tourist attraction, there is a little trickle of water that comes just down through those little cobbled stones there. And that was part of where Hazard Park is, there was a water. We had to live next to water because our ritual was we had to be in the water, we had to be in a sweat lodge, what they call a sweat lodge now, and have ceremony every morning in cleansing and then jump in the water. I don't care what the temperature was, we had to jump in the water and then, you know, we could go on with our day. So that water still exists and it goes underground and it comes back on Oliveira Street. And at one time the city wanted to close off that waterway and we fought it, you know, and we said no. It's very, you know, spiritual, it's very, you know, traditional, it's very part of history. Don't destroy it. It's been running for thousands of years, you know. Before everything was put on top of it, all the concrete was put on it, it ran, and that's what we did with the water. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, I'm not <laughs> losing my thought. Uh, what you're saying in that statement is very true. You know, and Thank you. to this day, we still have to fight for reburial of our remains that right. are disturbed. Right, 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 right. No, absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anybody else has any comments? And we'll just read two more passages and then we'll get back into it. Okay. Can somebody read, I know this is a, no, no, not the citations or the links, but can somebody read this, this passage, please? While the manifestations of colonialism. I can take that. Thank you. While the manifestations of colonialism and conquest faced and resisted by the Gabri Gabrielino and Tongva communities, as well as other indigenous people who've called this area home have been diverse, what guides the state's relationship to these communities is the logic of elimination. This logic includes not only summary liquidation of indigenous people, but also the construction of a colonial society on the expropriated land base, thus turning invasion into a political structure, which is then fiercely guarded by police. In fact, the Tongva scholar, Charles Sepulveda, urges us to recognize the connectedness between the struggles for police abolition and decolonization, considering them part of the same vision of creative reimagining of human relationships to place beyond the structures of white supremacy. Mm. What about this? Okay, once again, I say that's very Please. accurate. Mm -hmm. I agree with it 100%. Um, you know, um, in my land acknowledgement, I always acknowledge that um, I try to go back to our beginnings and then come to the colonization period and then I come to contemporary time so that it covers everything. Um, because our people go to school now, they work, you know, and when we were First Nation people before conquest and, and um, coming and stealing the land and killing the people, bringing disease and all that. Uh, we didn't have all those systems in place. 
We ate, we shared the food. It was a village communal type living, uh, you know. Uh, we had no need for punishment in jails and so forth. <clears throat> Did people do bad things? Probably, you know, but we shared the food when we had food. It wasn't just, you know, I go hunting for a deer and I have, I have meat now. No, we shared it with the community. And they had groups that went out and hunted. Uh, they sent the children into bushes and scared the, the rabbits out so that the hunters on the other end would get the rabbits. And they had a, a like a boomerang stick almost. And they had to hit that rabbit right on the neck and not let it suffer because they were reprimanded. You know, they were bad if they didn't kill that animal for food purposes. And of course they were used to pelts. We used everything. Um, but <clears throat> I, I was gonna say in my acknowledgement, I, I bring out about Bennett, who was the, fir the first governor of California. And there were 18 unseated um, um, treaties. I mean, treat there was 18 treaties that were never honored. That's what it is. Um, and we never ceded our land to anybody. They took it. Mm -hmm. And they killed us in the process, made us work in the missions. Some people ran away. Some were tortured. Um, you know, I, I've heard stories now. I have never, you know, I, I have to depend on the elders for this information that's passed on generationally. And because uh, we didn't have books, we wrote, we wrote our stories in the rocks, okay? And I've seen some amazing stories of how light came into being and uh, solstice areas. Um, but, um, <clears throat> you know, I've heard that the missions, if the men ran away, then they would cut their foot off and put it on a pole to scare the Indians because the men refused to come into the mission. It was the women and children that they took and made them live in crowded conditions and disease became very prevalent. We had no disease. We had no venereal disease. We had no measles or smallpox. Uh, the Europeans bought all that and uh, you know, lost a lot of people. If you go to the San Gabriel mission to their little, they have a little burial area in there. There's some, uh, I have a lot of relatives buried there, uh, but like the big monuments uh, like to Tommy Temple, who was, you know, a uh, city founder, they call him. He was a theft. He stole their land. Um, but there, you, as you look, okay, you see all these different plots, and they have built on top of it the streets and the Catholic school behind it and so forth. But there is one spot I never forgot. It had a wooden stick, and it said, here lies thousands of Indians who died of measles. Mm. So mm. we didn't even get an individual clot, okay? So yes, all that land theft, you know, I, and, and I look at California, as I study California, I've lived here all my life, and I know it's a beautiful state. We've got oceans, we've got rivers, we've got mountains, we've got deserts. We have it all, you know? and when I see the coast, which is where a lot, we all lived on the coast because Marit we had maritime cultures, we traveled. We went to, with, with the Polynesian people, we went to, you know, down in South America uh, <clears throat> because some of our artifacts have been found down there. But uh, the land is so valuable, you know, you have to be rich to live on the coast. So we can't even enjoy you know, our natural resources. That's right. That's because right. of the riches in California. Now, That's I want to point out something. Mm -hmm. This is what the state does or the government, okay? They pit us against each other. Mm -hmm. Okay, just take what's happening down at, I forgot what part of the beach it is like on California, where there was a black community over on the beach. Yeah, Bruce's and the beach. Family, yeah that's gonna get that land back, but they can't find heirs, mm -hmm. okay? Now, do you, do you think Indians are happy with that? Well, if they're getting land, why aren't we getting our land back? Mm -hmm. So I see that 
as a tactic to pit us against each other. I saw it in the 60s because I worked with anti-poverty programs. Um, and <clears throat> I saw that the, it's like throwing a, a, a crumb out to fight over it. You know, and I, I, that's what comes across when I hear about this land, you know. Right. I'm sure that family is entitled to it, but there are no heirs from the last thing I read. They're looking for, you know, people. Uh, they want to return it. So why won't they give land back? And there is a movement for land back right now for right. Indians, you know, uh, to get our lands back, our pieces of our land. We've been fighting for Puvuna, 22 acres. We took it to court. We won against the university because they wanted to build on it. And there's, it's a sacred site to us. Mm -hmm. And we have burials there. We have over 150 burials and over a thousand fragments were sent by UCLA. And we reburied those. <clears throat> and, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, uh, it's always a battle, you know, mm -hmm. from thousands of years ago, we're battling still. And mm -hmm. the government, has lands they could they're st i'm sorry i'm starting to see it in with different tribes they're getting land back mm -hmm. they are getting some return but for california for southern california i don't think they're going to let go of their lands because it's too valuable right. you know and it's you know look at what they're doing to old communities now with the gentrification you know and forcing people out and remodeling and you know almani it's a small little city that i live in but there's a lot of gentrification right now. They're closing down a lot of stuff and they're building the most ugliest condos I've ever seen. The colors are just disgusting, you know? Nothing, you know, we should have greenery. You know, I believe in, I have a native garden. Um, the city doesn't like it, but I told them if they come, they said they were gonna send somebody to come and cut it. And I said, do that. I have a hundred people in front of my house. And I'll be chained to my fence. Remove me. Try and remove me. <laughs> and I would do that, you know. But I won, you know. Um, they just found anything to harass me because I have all these native plants and medicine and so forth. And it's, it's I'm protected by several. There's a Native American uh, Religious Freedom Act. Mm -hmm. And in that, certain plants are protected. Like I have California white sage, and I have other plants that are medicinal. And, uh, you know, so I told him, I dare you to cut it. He said, you can cut anything. I own, uh, apparently my house sits, everybody's property, the first five feet belong to their city. Right. Okay, so I keep telling him, if it's your, if it's your land, come and clean it. Because it keeps sending me notices, yeah, there's too many weeds. And it's not weeds. It, dandelions have medicine, they have food, and they call them weeds, mm -hmm. you know. And I've offered to train them in this and that. They don't want, it. you know, so. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So Thank anyways, uh, yeah, but no, you. I, you know, you're really hitting things very accurately. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. And uh, just going to quickly read one last thing and then, uh, you know, just do what next and where do we go from here and other thoughts and everything else. So. Um, Gloria has been incredibly, <laughs> let me just look for that again. Where did it go? <laughs> Ready? Wait. Oh, shit. Give me one second. Sorry for that. I gotta, oh, there it is. Okay, cool. Uh, PDF, there it is. Okay. Um, one last passage, if we can read that and quickly move <laughs> on to the next thing was, okay. And then if anybody wouldn't mind this, this paragraph, and we'll stop from the reading piece after this. Anybody, please? I can read it. Thank you. The history of colonized Los Angeles also cannot be understood without a focus on the Black freedom struggle. At the same time, Los Angeles was being imagined as a haven for white settlers. Black people also looked to the city as a place where they could seek 
upward mobility through industrial work and land ownership. As Black people fleeing the racial terror of Jim Crow came here for opportunity and survival, the settler city responded with housing policies like redlining and racially restrictive covenants, barring Black communities from owning land outside of specifically designated areas like the one along Central Avenue and South Central. White settlers along the perimeter of these areas feared that nearby Black neighborhoods would threaten property values. As a result, policing was concentrated along the Central Avenue corridor to violently constrict the autonomy of Black people, even in their own communities. Any thoughts from anybody on this? Any comments, any thoughts? I have some comments, more comments. Sure, um, sure, sure, please. I work with groups. There's actually five in Los Angeles. They're um, they're trying <clears throat> they're trying to get the land. They're okay. Last summer or two summers ago, a group had taken over 45 homes that have been empty for right. so many years. Okay. Um, and, you know, they asked me to do a mourning ceremony, but I told them, I don't want, I don't want to know what time dates or when you're going to do this, you know, I'm just going to give you blessings and pray for you. And, um, well, they did that and they were instructed to buy all these things to break in, you know, close up and get their utilities put on and they were all arrested. So that's an excellent modern day thing about land and policing. Mm -hmm. You know, that alone, uh, three people were arrested at the first houses. Uh, one of my friends was arrested for trespassing mm -hmm. because he wasn't in the house. He was on the sidewalk, which is public, right? The city owns so much, you know, five feet of land. And he was on that and the cop arrested him for trespassing. And he says, I, this is not, this is public land here. You know, if I park in the street, you can't arrest me for parking in the street because it's public. You know, unless there's a sign that says you can't park there. So, but to me, that's just a modern day thing, uh, these these groups. And I worked with the one in Crenshaw. Uh, I found if I work, work with all five, I might be able to help, you know, be better off rather than working for the one in Northeast LA, which is the one they want. That's where all the people were arrested. And, uh, <clears throat> um, I haven't heard from them lately, you know, but I understand they are working. Uh, one of the, um, oh gosh, this, what is he, a congressman or a senator? I can't remember. He, they're trying to get those houses because there was a group that initially had gotten the land before right. that. And they were the ones that called the police, that people were breaking into the homes mm -hmm. you know, when they had done the same thing, but, you know. Uh, so now they're trying to raise funds, all these land, um, I forgot what they're called. Um, uh, anyways, they have attorneys and, and you know, it's very well organized. So now they're looking at trying to get it legally, you know, because uh, these houses have been empty. It was supposed to be a, a freeway that was built, but they never did mm -hmm. extend the freeway, you know, and uh, 45 homes. You know, there's a lot more and they're just locked up and they're well maintained. Somebody pays to you know, have all the grasses cut and the bushes trimmed. Um, you know, so, so, you know, again, here we have things that home, houseless people, these should, they should have first hand, are first in line to be, to get those homes. You know, but no, they, they, they keep saying they're going to clean up the streets and they're trying to make things good for the, the houseless people, you know, along the streets, downtown LA and, and this and that. But, um, you know, here are these homes, you know, and then when they try to build something or like take over a hotel or a big uh, apartment building, something that have, can house, you know, several people, a lot of people, the communities don't want them there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's this battle again, fighting for the crumbs. Right. Huh? right. Kidding each right. other's against each other's. 
So right. that's what yeah, we have to say. Definitely. And for some folks who may not be familiar with what uh, Gloria is talking about, this is uh, the homes that Caltrans, um, the state agency had, uh, you know, using eminent domain basically had removed people because the plan was to build the 710 freeway all the way up to South Pasadena. And this is again where segregation comes in. The, 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 the wealthy South Pasadenians um, they basically organize against that and organize against the, the and, and use their wealth and power and white supremacy. Uh, you know, obviously not favoring building any more freeways, but uh, just how it plays out. So now there's at least, I don't know, 200 homes or something like that and uh, that have been vacant, that have been sitting there. And then the, we have record homelessness. And you know, just uh, last year, both first there was a there was a big mobilization in March of last year, and then there was this big mobilization in the December of last year uh, for people who just took over these homes, and then they were they were arrested and and, and taken away. So yeah, but well, thank you very much. Really, really appreciate it. Okay, so uh, with that, um, you know, just to want to spend time with folks who want to share some thoughts. First of all, I want to really, really, really thank Gloria. Thank you so much as uh, not only a Tongva elder, but also an inspiration and for all of us. And I've heard some stories about your organizing from Lydia and some of the other, you know, friends in the, in the, in the native community and that whole, you know, facing up to those bulldozers and all of that, I've heard, that's a, you know, so, so thank you. Thank you for, for everything that you do and you continue to do, uh, Gloria. So um, yeah, and please stay. I mean, you know, uh, we'll be, we'll be on for, for a little bit longer. So um how, uh, so let's talk about it. How did this introduction and the first section kind of just resonate with people and what are some of the thoughts that come to mind? You were gonna say something, Amira? Uh, I, that wasn't. But yes, I can. I um, <laughs> didn't share earlier when we were talking about the introduction because I came as you all were um, involved in thinking it through and putting it together. But what struck me was in thinking through land and policing and what was the brief at that point. The terms that come from the LAPD, if I'm not mistaken, themselves offender based and location based policing, thinking about how locate what location based policing is about and how that works and how it is related to conquest and everything that we've been talking about so far this evening in the intro also i believe in the brianna taylor case it was called place based policing so mm -hmm. clearly it's um goes beyond la this uh form and i bet folks would be interested in um, hearing more about the process of, so when I first was started to become involved in the conversations, you were already talking about bids. Mm -hmm. I bet the pro folks would be interested in hearing about what led you to that and who, who were all the people working on that and putting those pieces together, working with around real estate, sorry for the background noise, <laughs> and getting to that relationship between real estate and um, private interests and how, of course, that's based on thinking about land as private property to begin with, but uh, that tied to this location-based policing these practices. Absolutely. Oh, those are beautiful voices of children in the background, so absolutely mm -hmm. very welcome to hear them. So, yeah. Um, so, anybody wants to talk about that, um, about the bids piece, or I know that's uh, that we, 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 we build on that later as well we don't want to give too much away but uh um Mamta, do you want to just speak about bids a little bit um sure so um yeah i mean i think that bids play actually a really important role um, bids are business improvement districts in different places they're called different things um up here in san francisco for example they call them community community benefit districts, no joke. Um, and, um, it, it, and essentially they're, um, 
bids are authorized under statute. Um, they're organized in a way that um, they allow property owners um, essentially to have control over their districts in a way that they can hire private security, um, they can um, have political influence. Um, and some of the things that we discussed later on in the report is how bids collaborate with um, the city attorney's office um, to evict people from their homes, to, um, to police their neighborhoods, to make them more, um, you know, savory for, for businesses and, and, the, and property folks. Um, and um, and it is per particularly troubling is their relationship to, to the police. Um, they often share data with the police. Um, police have access a lot of times. Um, you know, a lot of bids have direct uh, communication with the police. They have private, a lot of the private security that the bids hire um, are actually, you know, off-duty police officers. They moonlight as private security for bids. Um, so it's basically expanding, um, expanding policing and um, within neighborhoods under the guise of, you know, um, business improvement districts or community benefit um, districts. And uh, I'll, I'll just share, you know, sort of, I don't, folks may have heard what's happening in the um, Tenderloin neighborhood of San Francisco, which, you know, for many, their, their comparisons to, to Skid Row in Los Angeles has a large unhoused population, um, as well as um, a large population of folks of color, a lot of SROs, um, a lot of um, buildings that, um, you know, are, are uh, in disrepair. And, um, and recently, you know, there was news that the, that the mayor has, has said she's gonna declare um, an emergency and flood, flood the Tenderloin with more police. Um, it's the Tenderloin is already a very hyper policed neighborhood. Um, and, you know, as it turns out, um, this emergency declaration um, and, and these proposals and this, you know, big press conference was um, made subsequent to a meeting with the Tenderloin bid community. Yeah. Um, so, um, uh, you know, as in Los Angeles, in all parts of the, the country and really across the um, across the world, these bids operate in this way, amassing all this sort of political cloud and um, and access to politicians, to police um, and to really basically um, escalate. Um, gentrification of of neighborhoods um for you know um and clearing them clearing them for development and and this is you know this is this is a really telling thing that um you know and, and again it's always in the form of right we're, we're all, all of a sudden infested with crime and drugs and overdoses um and, right, like that, that, that's always the theme and an emergency right. and an urgency to eradicate folks from the streets. Um, they also, you know, there's some plan in there about how, um, how, you know, some beautification needs to happen in the Tenderloin, right? Like, so like this relationship to land, like all of a sudden now we care about, about, you know, um, uh, about, about uh, nature and about, you know, the environment um, that we need to clear the streets and it's bad for the environment, it's bad for health and, and, and you know, that kind of rhetoric um, after raping and stealing, yeah. raping the land and stealing from it and extracting from it and banishing people from it mm -hmm. and then back to that. Um, so anyway, that that's um, the, the Western Regional Advocacy Project uh, wrap is actually done um, tremendous work on bids. This is one of the main things that um, that they've worked on uh, in exposing sort of how bids operate and how they are um, embedded uh, within this political uh, structure of policing. And I can put a link to that in the, in the chat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mamta. Um, 
Uh, I'm going to quickly open up the, uh, the the study guide and just see what we had also developed through that as well. And uh, so here are some of the key terms that we've been seeing, you know, um, in the in section one and also in the, in the introduction as well. Um, and then, uh, and of course, there are some resources down here and then and, and, uh, Gloria was sharing some of the other stuff as well. So maybe just looking at some of the prompting questions, if they kind of just, uh, if, if they resonate with folks in this conversation, that how is property law tied to conquest? Uh, what is the role of private property? What does the role of private property play in systemic policing? What are your experiences with police when dealing with housing? What are some examples of displacement? Do you have any examples of ongoing displacement in your communities? Anything that you suspect may be contributing to displacement? And what do you understand occupation to be? What modern examples of occupation can you think in the world? Um, so I'm gonna leave uh, these up for, for a little bit, but uh, just wanted to see if uh, there are, um, you know, just uh, any, any thoughts, maybe what I'll do is I'll kind of copy and paste them in, in our chat as well. So, so any, any thoughts about, um, you know, just uh, if any of these questions people want to speak to? So I know it's a very legalist question, but, uh, but anybody wants to comment on how is property law tied to conquest? I can um, maybe start. Um, but, so some of my understanding of how property law is tied to conquest is that um, a really important part of settler colonial regimes was trying to individualize uh, property relations with land. And so like I was re I'd read elsewhere about uh, the history of Palm Springs and or I think there's the, the history of like US policy where they were trying to um, divide up land plots among Native Americans. Um, so my understanding of the purpose of that is to break up community bonds, to create sort of property owning accumulative subjects. I'm mm -hmm. sure there's a lot to add. Mm -hmm. So that whole intersection of property law and criminal law. So yeah, um, then, then comes into play as well. Uh, Susan, please go ahead. Uh, you have your hand up. It's obvious, uh, you know, that's one of the necessities of life, you know, and it's a human right. Uh, shelter, you know, and uh, food. And it's, it's, and it's, if you're going to uh, control a population or a society, take away uh, housing or you take away the food and our health care, and, and there you have it. And it's all about control in the United States. And uh, so they use it as a weapon. Uh, there is uh, eviction mills that have um, going on all over the United States. And if you look at the statistics on, it is people of color. Mm -hmm. that they, 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 they're redlining. And um, that's all about keeping people of color from uh, accumulating wealth in their family. I mean, you know, it, from the very beginning, um, it wasn't, you know, from the beginning of the United States. That's how it start. That's how it began uh, with uh, the rights of uh, people of color had no rights, and they they killed them. Mm -hmm. I don't know what mm -hmm. else to say. It's, mm -hmm. it's all Thank about you. That. Thank you, Susan. Um, thank you for sharing that. Um, Thank you, Lily, uh, because, uh, you know, just uh, exactly, because it's, it's interesting that then it kind of leads into the, uh, the next piece about what does, what role does private property law play or private property play in systemic policing? Because now it, it is there to secure uh, that going. Uh, Shakir, I see your hand up, go ahead. Sure, yeah, I was gonna also add an answer and this might be the, as you said, it's kind of legal ask question. Um, but I think a sim just a place to begin for this is that like when this country was founded and the American system of property law started to develop and kind of, you know, the early precedent for that, the two 
primary forms of property that kind of dictated the economy and that were the entire basis of like this new, you know, trying to figure out property relations and who owns who the two forms of property were one stolen land and two enslaved people, you know, so those like, so I think just you, it's again a matter of like, you can't understand the history of property in the United States without looking at those two kind of categories of property that, that, that were for one, on the minds of the, the you know, classes of lawmakers, judges, um, the, this, the whole class of people that was responsible for, for constructing our property laws and, you know, re refining them through the courts and all of that. And just that, yeah, like that, that, that in, like the sort of unique things that were, the, the, the aspects of American law that were unique from the like, law of European colonizers before, like kind of the things that really evolved in the American context were about conquest and colonialism, you know, they're, as they're trying to figure out how land is owned and transferred and all this stuff, that's what differs in the settler colonial, in a, in a situation of settler colonialism from, you know, how that was developing in Europe, because now they had to answer all these questions of like, how do, what do we do to create the legal relations around all this land that we're now claiming is our own. So anyway, so that's like, and, and those property laws, like literally those kind of doctrines and rules and all that stuff is also what continues to have evolved into our system today. So that's kind of mm -hmm. yeah, one way you see that evolution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I really appreciate uh, you reminding us, Shakir, that, you know, sometimes we, we forget the, the whole notion of property itself. Because I think uh, we kind of just flitter away in our thoughts and we actually think of property as actually owning people land, but you're reminding us that property was stolen land and a, a, a human body. This is how property was defined, uh, you know, just uh, so yeah, appreciate that, uh, uh, lifting that up. <clears throat> Other thoughts as uh, looking at the questions and, you know, we don't have to, yes, thank you, Pancake, for reminding us about capitalism, capitalism, and more capitalism and profit making. Absolutely. Um, so we got another 15 minutes uh, before we uh, before we close out. So looking at these questions or, or anything else that uh, what comes to people and, uh, you know, as we have lifted it, this relationship between land and policing and now this data driven policing. So Lily, go ahead. Yeah, I was just thinking about this question, what role does private property law play in systemic policing? And so, I mean, I mean, one thing I just noticed is like, for example, like libertarians love to talk about property as kind of the bedrock freedom that kind of justifies all other kinds of violences. And I don't think it's really just libertarians. I think that's kind of our base assumption that you can kind of murder somebody at the end of the day if they somehow threaten the boundary lines around your house. But also um, like valorizing of property, like having property mm -hmm. values go up gets sort of just talked about in this taken for granted way as like community development, opportunity zones, promise zones, like, um, and so one thing that I, like I've learned from years of y'all's work is the way that kind of policing is about, can be enlisted in like the systematic process, not only of protection, but of like valorization mm -hmm. of property. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Appreciate that. What about, um, ex go ahead, Shakir. Yeah, sorry, I just wanted to add more thing that, that Lily's comment hope that reminded me of, and I really appreciate that, is that is, yeah, like when you hear from libertarians talking about property law and property relations, there's this idea that like property is this kind of natural thing that like, you know, that, exactly. that without the state, we have these ideas of, okay, yeah, I created this, so this belongs to me or this land belongs to me. But I think what we know throughout history, and this is also what in the automating banishment report that we try to tell the story of exactly how this is operating today, is that property, perhaps more than any other concept or fiction is based on this kind of policing and and rule of, of force and and kind of state violence really like it can't exist without that and the whole thing is managed through policing and state violence so you can't it's not some natural thing that's existing you know without the state and in this libertarian kind of you know 
fantasy more than any other set of concepts or rules or whatever property is entirely you know dictated by um dictated by like who's able to exercise kind of violent power through the state um mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. yeah, the, yeah the policing kind of makes property definitely and, and and just wanted to throw that in there that the shapes it takes in our understanding and our imagination as well i mean i'm i'm i'm, I'm reminded uh, that you know during our our work with uh, you know working with the taxi workers uh, and organizing in taxi workers as well like you know where was this 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 supposedly this co-op system and where you know people who were owner drivers felt that they they owned the taxi and they owned the thing and but it was it was such a fallacy that how this this whole language of ownership was created yet it was the people who were running the taxi companies who really were the main power and the big families who controlled it, like the Rouse family and other folks as well, who really controlled the, the in New York, it's, it's, it's called the medallion, for example, which is not owned by the driver. Yeah, the medallion could be a $1.3 million medallion, but it's owned by the damn finance companies because you people are mortgaging every last cent of their of their penny that they have saved and it's mostly overwhelmingly i mean you know when in, in in la's taxi workers alliance when we were organizing it was like 49 different nationalities and it's predominantly immigrant communities who just see this as a, a pathway towards like advancing but then again how property is perceived how it's envisioned how it's imagined but in practice who owns it who controls it and who has access to it and ultimately you know if everything else fails then eminent domain comes in and next thing you know there's a whole freeway being built through city of compton and watts and everything else like who cares so to serve exactly um, you know, the purposes of people who think that they are getting property and they're getting away from these undesirables and going into their own Lily White, uh, not to yeah, you know, name Lily, but the, the suburbia, I was going to say. So, you know, just uh, so that's how these things, um, these things kind of just play out. My apologies, Lily. <laughs> so, so yeah, but yeah. Uh, Okay, so so this is really, really, really a good conversation. I'm 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 glad that you know people are are really into it. Uh, one more thing, like you know, currently, and I know if I uh, know uh, Carla was there from Street Watch, and if someone else, I don't know, uh, William, brother, if you want to talk about it, like someone from Street Watch about like some of the examples of displacement that that are going on, how people's bodies have become like this this political football, if you will. You know, as if these are not human beings, like, you know, Project Room Key, you know, while well, the now new enforcement zone, okay, now you can pitch your tent. No, you can't do that anymore. Okay, we were just like, you know, there are vacant homes. So, so thinking about like, you know, displacement and how it happens and unleashes in so many different ways, does anybody want to comment on that? Please, William, go ahead. Um. <clears throat> I was at a sweep today and it was very disheartening and frightening the mindset that develops in a lot of people um, over time uh, being under the, uh, these kind of conditions because the uh, people, a lot of people that I talked to today at the sweeps um, just have kind of settled into to this notion that it it is their fault and and they're just buying into it and uh basically there were the few people that were there were were giving up their property and they were just throwing helping the people throw away their stuff while they were in this horrible sad condition and um yeah it just uh goes to to show how far our work has to go um, to, to help people see um, their own value uh, even. It, it, it goes so much deeper than just the property because uh, people start uh, identifying their personal value with the value of the things that they own is, mm -hmm. I guess, is the, um, the point that I'm trying to make. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, I, I'll just add on to that. Uh, this is Tommy from Streetwatch. Uh, mm -hmm. You can hear me. Right, Tommy. Yes, please, Tommy. Um, yeah, it's it's something to do with the, uh, the just the almost like the end game of gentrification, just like a more explicit violence um, that like definitely ties into property and the way that uh, the government, uh, you know, the seller state sees property and in, in the way that like um, people on the street see property as well, like our, our entire city of LA, it, it's, it's, it's like the, the banishment zones are, are like a more explicit violence of, of the violence of gentrification that has been happening for so long. You know, it's just like, once the, once the contradictions like uh, reach a certain point, then people like are no longer housed. And then, and then, and then the violence of, 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 of the police and the business improvement districts, the, 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 the real hammer comes down hardest on, on people uh, who, who are living on the street. And, and there's something to be said there about how, yeah, you know, I mean, there, there, there's the claim of, of, of ownership of, of public land, as well as defending the claim of, of the landlords over their private land and, and supporting them uh, by erasing people um, from who, who fall out of housing onto the street. But in that defense of ownership over public land, there is like, there's like an Im implicit, um, you know, uh, assertion that people are not allowed to simply exist in the city in public space. Mm -hmm. uh, as, as people did for, um, since, you know, human history, we, we just like existed. Um, so it's, it, it's there, there, there's literally nowhere to live. It's like, we have to exist in these, in these tiny boxes that we are, we are being forced to, that is the solution is to reinforce the ideas of property so that, uh, landlords win. So that's so, I mean, it's like, get everyone off the street so that like so that so that we can continue to profit off of you is is yeah. is the is the is the basic logic of it. otherwise you know there would be no um there would be no violence from the local government against people on the street I, I, people should be able to just exist freely on the earth as it always has been mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thank you thank you tommy Vishnish, you have a comment Please go ahead. I have a question. Um, I'm just trying to um, understand how to conceptualize data ownership in, in the context of the discussion we're having on property ownership. Like with indigenous communities, there's the o OCAP ownership, control, access, possession. Um, then data for Black Lives has been promoting the whole concept of data trust, then with gig workers who are mostly racialized, talk about platform ownership. And um, that's going on in, in parallel, like with indigenous communities, it's going on in parallel with um, land back kind of um, move, movements and so on, right? So I'm just wondering if we should conceptualize data ownership differently, the, the same as land, the, the, are they kind of linked? Mm. Um, yeah, so more of a question, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting question. Anybody wants to? Thank you for raising that. Uh, Lily, you have your hand up? Yeah, uh, just like I mean, one thought I was having about that was that the way you framed data in the beginning of the session was kind of like, data is not just kind of, I don't know, information. It's like information that's specifically generated for certain kinds of social control. Um, and so in that case, in, the, in that sense, I'm like, okay, well, if we, like, if we own data collectively that has not been shaped by our own needs <laughs> as communities, then what is it exactly that we're owning? <laughs> um, and, you know, and the thing I don't really like about these kind of 
I think like Gavin Newsom was proposing something where we get to kind of own data, own our data, but then we get to sell it. It's like, okay, like I own the data that's made about me, but I can't actually produce anything based on it because it wasn't produced for my purposes. It was produced right. for Google's purposes or Facebook's purposes or like the fusion centers for you know pur purposes. Um, and so you know, all I can do as an owner of it is to put it into it's a legitimized circulation um, mm -hmm. and get twelve dollars for it. And that doesn't seem like a great deal, but I don't think I. I don't, yeah, I don't really understand the data trust argument myself. <laughs> right, 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 yeah. Well, it, it commoditizes it. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes, please. Um, it, it seems, sorry to, I, I mean, I don't know that I have any kind of right or wrong response, but it, it seems like it just seems to further commoditize the concept of personal, of, of like privacy. Um, or presumed privacy. I mean, at, at this point, it seems like mm -hmm. the people who, who, th that privacy has been utterly commoditized so that if one is under the scrutiny of, of a powerful adversary, that powerful adversary can purchase, um, purchase, information about websites that that a party has visited can place a person on a neighborhood watch list or can construct and slander a, construct a slander or defamation campaign about a person i mean a, a powerful entity or or adversary can basically rob a, another person of his or her privacy and, and sovereignty um, and um, mm -hmm. for whatever purpose. Right, right. Yeah, and that was, um, I mean, I think it's, 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 it's uh, regardless of what it is happening, I mean, the datification of our body is, is, is very much the, the force that's why we call it the stalker state, that uh, how we have constantly mm -hmm. being spliced into a gazillion molecular forms of data and it's all for the taking. And it's almost like recreating our beings um, and then you know just selling our recreated beings into so many different multiple ways. And I think that's where the, so I think for, for and, and we need to wrap it up uh, uh, soon in a couple of minutes, but uh, Ushish, I think one of the things our fight is really built upon that are just as today was an example that our histories and our, our lived experiences is our truth. And, and I think that's what the purpose was that also we're so honored to have uh, Gloria in our, with us as well, that, you know, that, that, that they can say whatever. They can just, and they can spend all the copper wires in the world and all the clouds in the world to gather data on us. But just this two hour conversation is completely debunks and discredits the claims that they have made with a gazillion miles of copper wires. So, so I think in a sense of, for, for, and, and, and it's a more, both on a personal level and on a collective level, that's at least for me on a personal level, that's where the fight is that, of course, I mean, I, I know, and that's what abolition is that, you know, for us that how do we make these systems irrelevant in our lives? How do we to the best of our abilities and, and, and in a sense that, yeah, they're there, but how do we just use it on our terms, but not in their terms? And then, you know, just, just, and, and, and yeah, so I'm not, so I think the, it's, it's, you raise a really interesting point and I think it's, it's, it's uh, to be continued, but I do appreciate, uh, you know, you lifting this thing because that generates and what exactly is data abolition and what does it mean to, for us in our lives? So folks, I, um, I, you know, sometimes the conversations are so deep and so awesome and so vibrant and so sort of living and so present. Uh, I hate to kind of just to stop this, but we've been at it for two hours. And these were probably some of the most engaging two hours. I really do appreciate it. Um, uh, our next online conversation would be on January 11th, um, which would be, we'll be going through section two. Um, so look for, uh, you know, just uh, uh, the Zoom link and information on our website, stoplapdspying.org. 
Um, you know, so so it, and then all the information will be there. Um, we would also appreciate it. We would love to ask uh, you folks that, you know, just today, um, just as myself and Gloria were having this conversation, we were going to have another comrade who was going to co-facilitate, but then because they were under the weather a little bit. So, so you know, just we want to team up. It's, you know, next time you're not going to see my my face talking all evening long. So, so, you know, so uh, I was, uh, I was honored to, 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 to really get this first section started, but uh, we want, we want this to be a collective piece. And uh, so anybody has any last comments or anything that they would want to share? Matios is going to put our, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I've got a quick one. I'm really sorry. I just want to make one point about this first section uh, that I think it does really well. And uh, Will's comment about how some folks, some unhoused folks feel they're, uh, they're deserving of uh, the kind of brutality they experience. And uh, Grandma Gloria's comments about uh, the very explicit brutality that indigenous folks felt made me think about uh, the very visible uh, brutality and violence that black people kind of experience and the way it's amplified. And that's just that this is all, um, and the through line being that this is all attacked by like occupying forces. Uh, and I just wanted to shout that out that um, that, that first part kind of highlights that beautifully. Uh, but yes, what am I plugging into the chat? <laughs> well, I forgot now. <laughs> um, I, I, I have a, a, a kind of um, maybe a self-interested uh, request, um, but I, I think other people might be interested in, in knowing more about this nexus also is how um, with the the um, the rise in like apps such as um, for I think it's called Citizen and then also mm -hmm. next door such mm -hmm. as apps such as those where you know that can contribute to a kind of vigilanteism. Mm -hmm. Um, some might say vigilanteism, I mean, uh, you know, or, or paranoia, what, whatever, oh, you know, they, they were doing this and we need to stick the police on them. Um, and also, I mean, how, so how these may or may not be part of this, um, part of the conversation. And then also neighborhood watch groups too, which from what I understand receive federal funding um and some people basically can get put on a list can yes. be placed on a neighborhood watch list yes. and um you know i i'd love to hear more about um if if if, if any of you all have any insights um or knowledge about any of these yeah, we actually uh, did a whole piece on this about three or four years ago, uh, which is really this whole idea of uh, a deputization um, is how it plays out. Mm. So, and then kind of building upon the see something, say something model, the neighborhood watch, and then the 10,000 eyes and ears of recruiting, uh, you know, citizen volunteers. And of course, Citizens app was used to be vigilante.com. So you, there actually was vigilanteism involved. So yeah, but we'll definitely love to do that. So folks, again, we can go on and on, but thank you very much for that comment. So really, really appreciate um, everybody, much love and uh, please be safe. Uh, and uh, because Omicron or Omnivore, whatever it is, it is out there. <laughs> so, so let's stay healthy and uh, let's stay suited up and, you know, that's dismantle and abolish. So thank you all very much and have a great evening. This, the, 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 the recording is gonna be up, up uh, posted on the website um, by this late Saturday, uh, this week. So please, you'll be, uh, go ahead and get it. So, all right. Thank you all very much. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.